So for the motivation for our time together, um, I was thinking about how in the Chinese tradition, there's a genre of texts called biographies of eminent monastics. And what is remarkable is that in the Chinese tradition, these biographi biographies exist for nuns. Very often, the life stories of women are not recorded in history. But in the Chinese Buddhist tradition, the biographies of nuns have been recorded since the fourth century. Um, and it w the first collection was put together by a monk who took the time to go to different nunneries, interview people, copy out inscriptions on stupas. And so you have these marvelous stories of nuns and all the different ways they practiced since the fourth century. Um, and later on, people also, the first set I think is fourth to 11th, fourth to eighth maybe. And then someone did like the continuation up to the present day. And there is so much we can learn just from reading these accounts. Some are a bit like hagiographies, but also there are those that capture like Chan discussions between teacher and student. They record obstacles people had to overcome to ordain. There are stories of nuns who were consultants for government officials. There are also ascetics. So, you know, you get the whole range of life stories. And perhaps we can think about this time to reflect on all the accomplishments, contributions of Venerable Master Heng Ching in the same vein, in terms of what we can learn from her great life example. Because otherwise, I think this session would irritate her to no end, <laughs> knowing her. <laughs> because she's so incredibly humble, she would be extremely irritated by the idea of a group of people getting together to talk about what she did. <laughs> um, so it's really for our own benefit. Um, she has obviously continued, you know, her continuum is, um, I don't know where, maybe Pure Land or already in the next life, um, intent on continuing to be of benefit. And she did it without any of the worldly concerns. So, uh, again and again, I just saw she just was of benefit because it was what was to be done. Um, so yeah, may we, through this time of um, rejoicing in all her examples of how to live a life dedicated to Dharma practice and what kind of impact that can have on communities, not just you know her local community, but worldwide. Uh, may we take inspiration from that and put whatever we have learned from her into practice in our own lives. Okay, so um, Venerable asked me to start off with just giving a brief biography of Venerable Heng Ching or what I know of her from books <laughs> and texts and so forth. Because of course, you know, from interacting with her, she never really talked about her life. Um, but she is a very important figure in Taiwanese history, not just Buddhist history. So the oral history archive actually did a set of oral interviews with her and have published them in Chinese. So she kindly gave me the Chinese transcripts of that after I badgered her for years. <laughs> and she told me that since I was so busy, I should just get AI to translate them. <laughs> so, and I have, but AI translation is definitely imperfect. So I'm in the process of checking that and we'll have the English available at some point. But so briefly, she was born in 1943 to a family of, um, she, she describes her mother as like a traditional Buddhist who would go to temples and pray with a lot of faith, but without much understanding of the Buddha Dharma. So that's how she grew up with that kind of cultural background. And she says she only really met the Dharma uh, when she was at college because she fell quite sick and had to take a year off school. And then her mother brought her to all these different temples to kind of pray and make merit. And she said at one of these temples, she met a monastic who gave her a picture book about the Buddha's life story. And she said she read that picture book and was just deeply moved by the Buddha's life. And that inspired her to want to follow in his footsteps. Um, so she recovered from her illness and proceeded to, uh, she earned a degree in English from Suzhou University in Taiwan. And then she went on to get like a master's degree in education from Rhode Island University here in the US. So she was always interested in foreign languages and she wound up going back to teach at her alma mater um, in the foreign language department. And so along the way, I think somewhere this aspiration to ordain must have arisen, but her parents 
uh, she didn't, yeah, I think her parents were not supportive. So she just kind of, you know, did her practice, continued to practice. Um, and eventually it came to be that both her parents passed away uh, within a number of years. And after that, she thought, ah, okay, now I can um, go forth and ordain. And at the time, she also happened to read in the newspaper an account of the Venerable Master Xuan Hua, who founded the city of 10,000 Buddhas uh, in Ukiah, uh, California. So back then, he was still starting his, the Golden Mountain Monastery in San Francisco, I believe. So she read this article about him, and she felt very inspired that he was um, training monastics to translate from English and Chinese, and that they, uh, they engage in ascetic practices. Yeah, so you know, they all, I don't know about ev the whole monastery, but Master Xuanhua is known for like, not lying down to sleep, uh, for having super normal powers, or they all only eat one meal a day. And so she was very drawn to both aspects, the translation aspect and the ascetic practice piece. And so when she read that he was in Taiwan, she immediately uh, tried to find a way to meet him, which she did. And he told her, yes, of course, you can come visit the monastery. So you know, one thing led to another. Um, she eventually wound up ordaining under him. Um, she, in her account, she also said that um, some of her siblings were against her ordination, so it would help to ordain elsewhere, <laughs> far away. She studied at um, Golden Mountain Monastery, I think, f at first just for two years. Um, she received the f so she ordained in 1975 at the age of 33. Then she received the full ordination the next year. Some of you have heard that story where um, there were a lot of visiting monastics from Taiwan coming to the US to celebrate the American Bicentennial or something. <laughs> Anyhow, this huge entourage of very eminent Taiwanese monastics were in the US and they visited uh, the city of 10,000 Buddhas. And so Master Xuanhua thought, oh, this is the perfect time to request them to give ordination. Like when else would you have all the right number of people here? And so she received her full ordination that way and she always says, but she didn't get the training. You know, she received the ordination, but not the full uh, training program. After that, she went back to Taiwan, where she uh, taught at Fo Guangshan University, uh, the Buddha Light uh, organization, and they, ha they asked her to help start a middle school. So she helped with starting a Buddhist middle school. But she still wanted to study more and learn more. So she wound up coming back to the US, and eventually she applied for the uh, Buddhist studies program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So she became, and that was a long period of study where she um, wrote her PhD thesis on the syncretism of Zen, uh, Chan and Pure Land practice, how the two uh, could be harmonized. And she was then uh, the first, she's known as the first Taiwanese bhikshuni to earn her PhD in the US. <laughs> and so, but what's more important is the kind of knowledge and contribution she then brought back to Taiwan. So eventually she wound up teaching at the National Taiwan University, where she founded the Center for Buddhist Studies. And then she organized like conferences at the national level to promote, you know, get students to share their dissertations. So like really creating um, Buddhist academia, I guess, in Taiwan. Like, the frame of reference, I don't know if this is accurate, it seems to me like what she did was what Jeffrey Hopkins did for this country, setting up Buddhist studies at University of Virginia. So, you know, she drove the setting up of the Buddhist uh, Center for Buddhist Studies. She had this vision to have this huge Buddhist digital library um, because I asked her why she did that and she said, yeah, back in the day, you know, there were no digital resources. You were digging for everything in the stacks. Uh, Master Panyin said, you know, you're trying to look for a quote in the entire Tripitaka you just go pray. <laughs> what can you do? You can't find it. And he said, go bow to the Buddha and hope for the best, right? Now you can search. And so she had this vision of like, I want to make things digitized and searchable. So she created this, um, the causes for this big digital library database and raised a lot of money so that it could be sustained and still available freely uh, online to all scholars. And she also drove the digitization of the entire Chinese canon because I think she had heard about some people doing the digital input and she thought, oh, this is really important. And she helped to get a team together and get funding. You know, so those are some of the things that she is most um, uh, remembered for in Taiwan because you know, this was such a huge contribution to the Buddhist, um, the growth of Buddhist studies in Taiwan. So I guess that's the, the accomplishments piece, <laughs> but that is something I know from books. Um, the way we've met her here is as a very kind Dharma friend who helped to establish our community and taught us many important things. And that piece I think Venerable can tell us more about. Okay. 
so okay so uh, I first met Venerable Heng Ching in 1986 and uh, the connection oh this picture was taken earlier this year yeah you can see by the people in the gray robes <laughs> so uh, you know, I had wanted to receive the bhikshuni ordination. Very few uh, nuns in the Tibetan tra tradition had done it at that time, but Venerable Karma Lekshe Soma had, and she and I were friends. And so uh, when I told her I wanted to do that, uh, well, first of all, I had gone uh, to His Holiness and asked his permission, and he said, yes, of course, I'll pray. And that's all I needed, because I knew that if my personal teachers didn't agree, uh, what His Holiness said would trump them. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't disagree if His Holiness said that. So, uh, okay, so I'm going, but I don't know anybody in Taiwan, so I asked uh, Venerable Lekshe Somo, you know, for help. And so she linked me up with Venerable Heng Ching. So I arrived at the uh, airport in Taipei, and she picked me up and took me back to her flat. She doesn't remember any of this. It's interesting, because it's quite vivid in my mind. Uh, and so uh, she got me dressed up in Chinese robes, and uh, I learned the uh, the very careful practice of when to change shoes. When you enter the apartment, you change shoes. When you go from the living room to the bathroom, you change shoes. When you come out of the bathroom, you change shoes back. Yeah. When you uh, go into the kitchen, then you change shoes again. And when you come out of the kitchen, you change. So you spend a lot of time changing shoes uh, in Chinese. Uh, with Chinese monastics and in Chinese temples. So you're changing clothes a lot and shoes a lot. Anyway, she got me all dressed up as a Chinese nun and put me on a bus uh, to go to Kaohsiung. Um, and I arrived in Kaohsiung and somebody from the monastery picked me up yeah, and took me back to the monastery and that's where this was 1986, and so I received the full ordination and then came back through uh, Taipei and, you know, saw her again, and then she sent me off. Okay, so that was my, my first contact with her. Um, I'm trying to think. I had heard stories of her before that. Okay, one of the first stories I heard was... I think it was around uh, 1977 or 78 when His Holiness came to the U.S. to give the Kala Chakra. It was organized by Geshe Zopa, and it was uh, a comparatively small event to what you may have been to in latter years, later years. So, uh, so she was attending that, and. Uh, Somewhere in during the teachings, it was so uh, posada or so jung day, the day that the sangha confesses and restores our precepts, and she was the only bhikshuni there. And um, before the the bhikshus met, they were still, you know, he, his holiness was still teaching, and uh, he was saying, you know, we will have so jung after this, and then somebody, not venerable Hengqing, but somebody said, uh, but there's a bhikshuni here. What about her? And, and His Holiness paused. And then he said, she can come to the bhikshu sojam. <laughs> the earth shook at that moment. <laughs> you know, I don't think the Tibetan monks had ever considered that as a possible existent phenomena, <laughs> you know. Anyway, 
Uh, so she went to, you know, she attended the sojourn with the bhikshus. This is not normal Vinaya practice, but His Holiness made the exception because, you know, there was only the one bhikshuni there. And I think it was also a message to the bhikshus. Okay, so I had heard that story about her and, you know, of course, being very impressed. And then, then what? Fast forward some years. Um, well, maybe not, maybe around that time. Uh, because by that time, Karma Lakshasama was, was very active in trying to get the t Tibetan tradition to, you know, allow for bhikshuni ordination. And the first thing the His Holiness and the monks asked for was a record of the lineage in China. And so Venerable Heng Ching had given that to Venerable Thomo, who then gave it to the Department of Re Religion and uh, Culture in the Tibetan government uh, in exile. Okay, so she was very instrumental in passing these documents that the Tibetans wanted to show the existence of the lineage. Uh, and in her mind, uh, there was never any break in the lineage. Then there was a meeting in, um, I don't know what year, maybe you know, in Dharamsala, the big meeting with Venerable Daohai. Uh, with, yeah, sometime. There were the, yeah, in the 90s, uh, in the 19, in the 19th, in the 20th century, <laughs> there was, <laughs> uh, there, you know, because the Tibetans wanted to learn more about the Chinese tradition and the Vinaya lineage, because that was very important to them. So there was a big meeting um, in Dharamsala and uh, with Chinese scholars and Tibetan scholars. And apparently, okay, uh, as I understand it and I have read, um, Venerable Daohai, who was a very prominent bhikshuni, a bhikshu, I'm sorry, prominent bhikshu in the Chinese tradition, who had been the preceptor, the main preceptor for many bhikshuni uh, ordinations, and had also taught the bhikshuni pratimoksha, okay, uh, that he was giving a paper. The paper was written by Ven uh, one of his students, Venerable Fasheng, who some of you may know from the retreat, who has his own ideas about some things that uh, are not necessarily um, in line with uh, contemporary Western thought. Am I being polite enough? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and it seems he wrote the paper and uh, that Venerable Daohai, his teacher, gave. And uh, the paper said something about the Vikshuni lineage having been broken. So this is what the Tibetans remembered. Okay, oh, this prominent Vikshu said that. But then the fact that he was giving the ordination and explaining the Bhikshuni Pratimoksha, I thought, did he really say that? So um, when, through my friendship with Venerable Jendi, when I heard that uh, he was coming to the U.S., I asked if I could possibly meet him. And so that was arranged, and I met him. Venerable Benyan was there, some of you know him. And then a few other bhikshunis, uh, and a translator, one bhikshuni translated, but it was a difficult, uh, she wasn't, she wasn't as good as you. Um, <laughs> as she levitates now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, so it came out, you know, I had a chance to meet Venerable Daohai, and he was talking about in Chinese history, there was a certain point during the Northern Song Dynasty uh, where the emperor made 
a rule that bhikshunis could no longer go to bhikshu monasteries. So that put, you know, a wrench in the bhikshuni ordination. And they don't really know uh, how long that ban was in force, nor do they know how well it was upheld. You know, um, when I asked Venerable Hengching about that, she was uh, adamant that the lineage was not broken at that time. She said the ban um, didn't last that long, uh, but nobody really knows there's no... um, uh, certain historical record of exactly when the emperor's son, the new, new emperor, lifted the ban. But Venerable Hengqing was certain that it didn't last for very long, and that probably in the, um, well, in the cities where the emperor had control, it was probably upheld, but outside the cities and in the countryside, Probably they were having ordinations as usual, the dual ordination as usual. So, uh, you know, we, I talked to her a lot about that. Um, and then in 19, no, it was here. It was in 2004, okay? By that time, discussion uh, amongst nuns in the Tibetan tradition, you know, more people were interested in the ordination. And so a very small group of us, um, Venerable Jumpet Sejran, Venerable Lekshesomo, me, um, one Sakya nun, I can't remember her name, we asked Pema Chudran, but she was in retreat, but she gave her blessings for it. Um, and with Venerable Hengqing, we, for, we formed a committee called the Committee for Bhikshuni Ordination. And so it happened in uh, 2004 that we had our first meeting here with the objective of writing a paper, uh, a, a little bit about the history of bhikshuni ordination in, um, in China. And, you know, with... Uh, yeah, the history and, you know, the lineages and so on, and some ideas about how the ordination could be given to uh, Tibetan bhikshunis so that they would have the Mulashravasta Vada Vinaya lineage, uh, whereas in in China the Dharma, uh, it's the Dharmagupta lineage, Vinaya lineage. So they're different lineages. Um, there's not huge differences between the Vinayas, but, and, and it's quite interesting, I'm, I'll go off on a little tangent here, but um, the, the difference in the Vinaya is as the modern people see them. The, for the Tibetans, you know, we hold the Mula Shavastavada lineage, that is it. Even when Lama Atisha came to Tibet, he was he was from the Mahasangika uh, Vinaya, and they asked Lama Atisha not to give ordination because they didn't want to mix Vinaya traditions and they didn't want another one. To me, that is shocking. Yeah, but anyway, it happened. Um, uh, I could go off into a lot of tangents about this. I will not. I will come back to Venerable Hengqing. Okay, so um, she was, you know, Venerable Hengqing was always saying, look, if they want to do it, they can find a way. You know, one idea is <clears throat> uh, because the Buddha initially said that the bhikshus give the ordination, so one idea is that the Tibetan bhikshus give the bhikshu the ordination, that's in line with the Vinaya, and then the nuns are Malashavastavada bhikshunis. The other possibility was to use Chinese bhikshunis and, um, and Tibetan monks, but uh, the lineage that the nuns received would be Malashavastavada because the monks were the ones who confirmed the ordination. So it would go towards them. So these two ideas were, were you know, put forth a lot. 
And the Tibetans had different conferences of the lamas and, and uh, abbots and so on over the years to discuss this. Never any conclusion. OK, so then, then, um, Venerable uh, Champa Sejana, uh, together, she was a professor. Well, at that time she was, I think, a grad student, but she became a professor at a university in Hamburg. And so together with some of the professors there, she arranged a conference in Hamburg in uh, 2007. And it was to discuss uh, the Vikshuni lineage. Okay. His Holiness uh, had said repeatedly, uh, I heard it with my own ears many times, that he favored having uh, the Bhikshuni lineage in, uh, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, as long as the ordination was given in, in a proper way. So Jampa Sejrinla really hoped, that, and but he said, you know, this is not for him to decide, and it's not even uh, for the Tibetan Sangha as a whole to decide. But it was he what he wanted was an international conference of uh, the respected bhikshus from all the different lineages to, to come together and to, for them together to decide that they will you know, uh, revive the bhikshuni lineage where it has been lost, um, probably by um, you know, having the, the Chinese bhikshunis with whatever bhikshus from that tradition. Uh, and so he said, you know, it, he really wants a conference like that. In my mind, making a conference like that is, um, and getting all the monks from the different traditions to agree. I'm trying to think of a good analogy of how likely that is. Uh, and I can't think of one, but you, you can, you can maybe guess. So, so Jump, but some Jump at Sage La has such a passion for this, and she was really, really, really hoping that His Holiness, at the end of this conference, would say it's now restored in Tibet. So Venerable Heng Ching was at that conference, as was Venerable Wu Yin. Okay, and. Uh, yeah, a lot of things happen. I won't go into all of that. But uh, at the very end of the conference, the last day, they had a panel with, some, with the monks from the different traditions, plus some of the academic scholars who had done research on the, on the lineage and uh, you know, the importance of bhikshunis. And they all spoke with His Holiness was sitting. It was a like semicircle like that with His Holiness in the middle and the other people around. Uh, and they all gave short presentations to His Holiness about that. And they were all waiting for His Holiness to wave the magic wand and say, now there will be Vikshuni ordination in the Tibetan tradition. I'm not w quite sure why they expected that when he had said for years and years and years that he wanted a conference, you know, so that it was really established in all the traditions so that I think after he was gone or later, nobody would come and say, but, 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 this wasn't kosher, you know. So, uh, of course, he said, no, I can't do that. And, you know, the whole room was like, you know, I, I saw it coming. I didn't know what else he was going to say. Okay, but, you know, he said that the meeting, he, he, he gave the idea that uh, uh, we go to Dharamsala and have... Um, uh, the Varsa, Bhikshuni Varsa in Dharamsala, and that we do the, um, you know, at Posada, that we recite the Vinaya by memory. Yeah, the Bhikshuni Vinaya is uh, 
It's longer than the bhikshu vinaya. And the bhikshu vinaya is already pretty long. Okay. Uh, so th that was his idea, but, you know, to kind of nudge the Tibetan monks. But anyway, it was a, how do they say in, uh, now what they would call it is a PR disaster. <laughs> okay. Um, after the, that, that session, the conference is over, His Holiness was supposed to leave the next day. Uh, Venerable Tenzin Katra and I met with uh, Venerable Wu Yin and Venerable Heng Ching, and they were livid. Yeah, and they were really upset about the whole thing. Uh, uh, especially, well, both of them, you know, especially I think maybe Venerable Heng Ching, because she had put in so much energy um, finding the resources, the scriptural things, and talking to people and attending these conferences. And yeah, so yeah, the four of us chatted, and, and, and then later that afternoon, we got a phone call. His, I think His Holiness recognized it was a PR disaster. And he um, said, tomorrow morning, this is the day he's supposed to leave to go to another city, six o'clock, please come to this room. All, you know, all of the nuns and the, the, the women interested in the um, Bikshuni ordination. So at six o'clock the next morning, there was this improv um, meeting with all these people. <clears throat> Venerable William, Venerable Hunting were there. They spoke, yeah, and did what they could. And, you know, His Holiness again repeated uh, the need for this kind of conference. And uh, there was some thought that, you know, may <clears throat> that maybe. Um, Rinshin Kandrola would organize it, or the, somebody would organize it. Anyway, it never got, it never happened. But so, you know, that uh, kind of connection with Venerable Hang Ching, and just seeing how persistent she is. Yeah, when she knows something is beneficial, she is like, excuse, the analogy, like a dog that bites you and does not let go, okay? I know that from my own experience. I will tell you some more, <laughs> okay? So, but she always had incredible respect for His Holiness, you know? So, okay, so where does that bring us? That was in 07. So how did we make the first connection with Puyi Nunnery? Was it through Venerable Hang Ching? Yeah. So, oh, before that, she came yeah, before that. So she, we invited her to come here, and uh, which she did. The first time she came, as I remember it, um, we met in the meditation hall, and she brought up different points about the Vinaya and asked us, you know, how, how would you keep this precept? What does this precept mean in such and such a situation? It was really very good. And uh, it, as it happens, uh, Puyi Nunnery, where we stay when we first uh, land in Taipei, she introduced us to those nuns, and she's been teaching those nuns, Vinaya, for how many years? 20 years, I mean, a really long time. And uh, apparently doing it in a, you know, because she knows Vinaya so well. She, you know, she was a professor at the university. But, um, yeah, so she was, you know, really for it when our little committee of Bhikshuni, uh, for Bhikshuni ordination, uh, published a, a booklet, uh, you know, about the possibility of reviving it. They were, like, really behind it and so excited about it. Okay, so that's how we made the connection with Puyi, uh, where we stay whenever we go there. Okay, so then somehow Venerable Heng Ching 
uh, got it in her mind that uh, I should be the preceptor for a bhikshuni ordination here at Travasti Abbey. And I said, well, that's nice, uh, but, <laughs> you know, I said, yes, but, um, you know, I need to learn something about how you do that. I mean, because the Chinese, when they give the ordination, it's a whole program um, that lasts either four weeks or the one you went to was six weeks which is better. So it's a whole program. You can't just like side, decide, well, we're going to do this and, you know, in a month it's organized. Uh, and, you know, and then being mindful of the tradition, it's, it's like, you know, I, I, at that, by that time I had edited Choosing Simplicity, Venerable Wuyen's teachings, and Venerable Benyan's uh, teachings about the Sangha Karmans. There's a quite a thick book downstairs in the, in the uh, book nook uh, that he wrote that's really good. And he, uh, so, you know, she, she taught the Vinaya, then she had this idea, then I said, well, I need to learn. And, uh, you know, Venerable um, Sipel's ordination was coming up in what year? What? In 19, okay, 2019. And so, uh, Venerable Heng Ching and the abbot of Puyi, Venerable Xiaoyin, um, they knew Tiger Mother. Yeah. Tiger Mother was, that wasn't her real name. <laughs> it should have been. Um, <laughs> uh, she was the guide during uh, the ordination, in some case ordination. And the guides, you know, they have bhikshuni guides and bhikshu guides. These are actually the people who run the whole program. The preceptors just come there for the ordination, but the guides are the important ones. So they knew Tiger Mother, who was the head guide. And so they broached to her the topic of me coming just to observe how they give the ordination. Okay, and uh, they talked and talked, and then I think Venerable Heng Ching uh, said something behind my back to her, uh, because what came out of that was an invitation to be one of the preceptors, which was not what I had I was hoping to go as an observer and the invitation, which was an incredible honor. I don't think that any of the other Western bhikshunis have been invited to do that, I've, you know. But it gave me the opportunity, you know, we went together for your ordination to really observe, you know, how the ordination is given, how the training is given, how the teachings of the, on the precepts were given. And, and so Venerable Heng Ching, you know, after that, well, before that too, uh, you know, remember, she's got my leg with that. Oh, that's why my leg hurts. Um, <laughs> is uh, with, you know, you're going to be the preceptor of this ordination at Shravasti Abbey. And these ordinations are not small things. You know, in Taiwan, you have hundreds of applicants. So my excuse was we got to build the Buddha Hall. You know, I mean, otherwise we have no place for people to sleep. You know, the meditation hall won't, would barely hold 20, the, 20 preceptors, let alone the candidates. Um, so every time I saw her after that, every time, yeah. When's the Buddha Hall gonna be done? When are you giving the ordination? I think when you give the ordination, you should just make an announcement in English, uh, you know, to all the countries uh, where the English is, and tell them that you're going to have the bhikshuni ordination, and kind of come one, come all. And I said, Venerable Henching, I can't do that. You know, first of all, I really want people, you know, if I'm going to 
be involved in an ordination. They need to take the, the Shikshamana ordination first because we want you know, to do everything completely according to Vinaya so that the Tibetans could, could never fault us for being sloppy with that, even though we were doing it in another Vinaya tradition. And, and also, I think the Shikshamana is really helpful um, because it gives you, you know, you become a novice, a shramanary, and then you have two years of training before you take bhikshuni. And so we instituted this also for the bhikshus. They don't take a shiksham, shikshamano um, <laughs> ordination, but they keep their novice for, for two years, um, you know, so that, so that you have the training, because it's really helpful. So... Yeah, so he's every time asking me about it. And every time, I mean, some of you were here when we had some phone conversations, Zoom conversations with her, and you'll remember that she brought it up and hammered it in. Um, so, you know, when she is persistent, and, uh, and she will do everything that she is able to do to make it happen, yeah. So, you know, she talked to some of her friends and other people. She recruited donations for the Buddha Hall, you know, and donations for to give the, uh, the ordination some time. She kept on asking me when. I said, in the future. <laughs> yes, not in the past, not in the present. It'll be in the future. Okay, what else did I want to tell you about her? <laughs> yeah, I think that's about it. Um, Venerable Wayman, who we uh, rely on during Varsa, was one of her students. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so that was another connection yeah, with the Dharma, with the Dharma drum, and with the university in particular. Okay, to be continued someday when we have the ordination here. Yeah, it. I, I should say it costs a fortune to uh, have an ordination. I mean, I can't even think of the amount of money that it is to, uh, and what I found out is, like at Fomin Su, where you had some of you to coordination, um, that the we call her Kenmo, the abbess, although she performs the function of the abbess at that temple, but she doesn't have that title. Um, she went around to each of the bhikshu you know, possibilities, monks who could um, be preceptor, and the bhikshunis, and she went to their monastery, bowed down, and personally requested them to come and be preceptors. No, this was at Fomensu, at, at your ordination, which is, I mean, the amount of time, you that's 20 people, you know, that you have to go and ask personally. I don't know. She may have done that with the guides, too. I don't know. But she definitely did that with the preceptors. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a big thing. And we hold it in our hearts because I think being able to do that would really firmly implant Buddhism here in this country and implant the Sangha in this country, which is something I think is really important for the existence of the Dharma in the West. And then, of course, whatever we can do to, to help the Tibetan nuns, you know, we do that. But uh, it's up to the Tibetan nuns themselves to speak up if they, if they want bhikshuni ordination, you know. We're not doing that for them. And she taught us to enter Varsha. And she what? She taught us to enter Varsha. 
Oh yeah, and then, uh, okay, then she came back another time. And uh, she also was the one who taught us how to do posada, you know. We had the text, yeah, I think it was posada as well, and varsa, and pravarana, and um, katina. So these major ceremonies in the Vinaya, she taught us how to do them according to the Dharmaguptaka tradition. And we implement those now. And we found that they're quite meaningful, aren't they, in our individual minds and to create a sense of community. Okay, I think we're running on a tight schedule, so maybe we should just show the videos that she made, or does anyone want to comment? Or yeah, we, maybe we can have a bit of space for that. Any questions for Venerable or comments? I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about her contribution to translations, such as the, the Vinaya materials we have, what her, her role had been in translating. Um, actually, she also, I forgot to mention, she was involved in the translation of the Chinese Tripitaka into English as well. So she translated the sutra and the 42 chapters and then the sutra and the Upasaka precepts. There's an ongoing project funded by a company called BDK, Budo, Duko, I, I don't speak Japanese. Um, you know, they fund, they're funding the translation of the Chinese Tripitaka into English. Um, and then it was her passion. She really wanted to see the entire Vinaya, the Chinese Vinaya in English. And so she was trying to push us to do that. And thankfully she found an academic who is now sponsored by BDK to do it. Um, but her role, I, I'm not sure if she helped. So many monastics have helped with all the drafts of the translations we have. They're all in the credits. Um, but for sure she got uh, the uh, Varsa Pravarana text going. Um, the way she works is we'll always go back to the root text. That's how she taught us. Um, so she gets the Skandaka translated first. So she worked with Venerable Tian Chang. The Skandaka is like the chapter in the Vinaya itself that tells you what to do. And that's where the ritual is taken out from. Yeah, so then, so you have, to, first you'll do the Skandaka, then you work on the ritual. So it always goes back to what the Buddha said. Um, so she was working with Venerable Tian Chang at the time, who has a PhD from University of Washington. Right? Yeah, and it was a. She, would, she had visited here too and was in your organization. Yeah. So all these nuns have just helped us with all those drafts. And I came in at the time when we needed the Katina ritual. And so she taught me how to translate. Yeah, I did the first draft and then I sent it to her and she laughed and laughed and laughed. And she said, oh, you, you don't know classical Chinese because you've translated all the extra auxiliary terms that don't need to be translated. <laughs> so, so she taught me to read every single word, one at a time. And she was extremely, extremely kind and patient. Um, so yeah, that's her contribution, teaching someone to translate. Um, tirelessly, Venerable Pema got to join in the classes later on too. And she just taught us word by word. So we were incredibly fortunate. Um, I've read a lot of texts with her, um, including things written by Master Tao Xuan. Um, you know, like I just wouldn't be able to read them alone. And she was always available for us to call as a resource. What moves me very deeply is that she sent me just about everything under the sun she had as a Vinaya resource. You knew she was doing this because so that after she passed away, we would still have a reference. And she linked me up with a monk in China who is, is a Vinaya expert. Um, who is, uh, who is uh, yeah, who loves her dearly too as a teacher. So, you know, we'll always have a resource. That's, that's the kind of teacher she was. <laughs>